That's a hard act to follow. Uh, maybe I shouldn't try. Thank all of you for coming out. Uh, it's great to see everyone here. And frankly, uh, I'll do anything Susan Witt asked me to do. So I'm uh, really happy to, to be here and accept her invitation and to have this opportunity to be in the Berkshires, which I'm going to talk in a little bit about, just mention in passing, some of the fantastic contributions that this region has made uh, to building the future, to bringing the future the, into the present, uh, which you have done so, uh, so well here. Um, and um, she reeled off all the organizations that I've been with, and as Bill Moomaw and others here might testify, they've, every one of them has done better after I left. <laughs> she also read Wendell Berry's uh, poem, which I hadn't expected, but uh, you know, it, it kind of concludes with uh, yes to the children. And that's really the origins of this book, because Cameron and I uh, have these, uh, like many of you, we have six grandchildren now. And I've begun to think very hard about what kind of world do we really want uh, for them. And I think, um, you know, both of the candidate presidential candidates in the last election asked the right question. They kept saying, what kind of America do you want? And I don't think either one of them gave us a tolerably good answer to, to that question, but uh, it is the right question. Uh, what is the country that we want to build? And we'll never build the country that we would want for our children and grandchildren unless we have a powerful sense of where we really are uh, today, whether we're attending, uh, as Lincoln put it, uh, whether we're attending. And uh, I think, uh, you know, you can get at least some sense of where our country is today uh, and, and what the, the gap that exists between where we are and where we're headed and where we need to go uh, by looking at an international sample of, uh, of the 20, say, uh, advanced, uh, most advanced democracies. And uh, I did that in the book. And I looked at 30 indicators of national well-being and international citizenship. And uh, some of you may be familiar with this depressing uh, finding. But uh, when you do that, what you find is that um, we have the highest poverty rate. We have the highest level of inequality. Uh, we have the least uh, social mobility. This is among all the advanced democracies. Uh, we have the lowest score on the UN's material well-being of children index. Uh, this will probably surprise a lot of the men in the audience, but we do the worst uh, on the UN's gender equality index. Uh, you know, I won't go into, well, we spend the most on health care by far. And uh, out of that, uh, all of that money, we get the highest infant mortality rate, the highest prevalence of mental health problems, the highest obesity rate, uh, the highest consumption of antidepressants, and the shortest life expectancy. It's a great buy. Uh, and, uh, you know, our, our uh, international standing and in, uh, tests of uh, uh, academic achievement are very poor. We have the highest homicide rate. By far the largest prison population, both absolutely and per capita, we have a fourth of the world's prisoners in, in our country. Environmentally, you know the sad story. Uh, we have next to highest carbon dioxide emissions uh, per capita, the highest water consumption per capita, the lowest score on the environmental performance uh, index uh, that Yale and others maintain, the second largest ecological footprint per capita. We used to be for decades at the bottom of the OECD in international spending on, on, on poverty alleviation and humanitarian causes around the world, but uh, recently a couple of countries have um, sunk even lower than uh, we are. Um, and, um, you know, we have the, well, the military is just out of sight, right? We, we have about a, almost half of the world's military expenditures. Uh, we estimated have a thousand military installations around the world in some 38 countries. Uh, and, uh, you know, and we have uh, probably troops on the covert and, and clandestine operations underway in uh, maybe 40% uh, of the world's countries uh, estimate um, and 70% of the world's arms sales. So, you know, we're number one, all right, uh, in exactly the way that we 
uh, don't want to be. And there's a lot more bad news, but I won't flather it on, uh, except in one respect, and that is our democracy. Uh, you know, right now, our, our Washington and many of our states uh, uh, aren't even seriously trying to address this list of problems, and this is a far from incomplete uh, list. And we have uh, neglect, uh, denial, uh, stalemate, uh, ruling uh, the day. I think uh, my principal reaction, for what it's worth, at the end of this election was uh, one of uh, relief. Uh, and, uh, and I think, uh, you know, we, uh, the progressive causes uh, dodged a, a bullet, but it didn't change the fundamentals of our political system. And we must remember, corporations spend maybe 10 times as much on lobbying and influence peddling as they do on elections. Uh, so we have a serious uh, democracy deficit uh, in the country uh, right now today, and one, you know, has to be concerned about that, and I want to talk about it in a minute. But this leads me to four conclusions that I want to focus on uh, this evening with you. Uh, the first of these conclusions is, um, you know, if we're going to set about in earnest uh, to correct uh, these problems, um, we will need to forge together uh, a really coherent, positive, and plausible vision of the America that we could together build. And there's been, it seems to be, far too little attention on building a new American dream uh, among uh, the public and among ourselves and among progressives. If we don't know where we want to go, we're very unlikely to get there. Uh, the second conclusion is that with capacities in Washington so limited, uh, you know, we've got to build the future, as you're doing in this region, uh, from the ground up. Uh, at the local and regional uh, levels, in our communities, in our bioregions. The third conclusion is that we've got to prevent uh, calamities from spinning out of control, calamities like climate change, and absorbing all the available time and energy and money that should be spent on more positive uh, endeavors. Um, and lastly, uh, if, if we don't achieve real citizen sovereignty, in our country, if we don't beat back this creeping corporatocracy and plutocracy that so affects our politics, this ascendancy of money over people, uh, then we're unlikely to achieve either uh, modest incremental change or the deep systemic changes that I argue for in the book. So first, let's talk about a new American dream. Uh, let's explore this terrain of an America that could be uh, what I call America the possible. I think it's still possible to conceive of, to believe in, and to fight for a vision of the future, uh, and it's plausible and attractive. But time is running out. It won't be an easy fight, it won't be a short fight, and time is running out to begin that fight. So if I, if I sound a little, sound a little uh, utopian uh, when I go through this depiction of what America could be like a few decades down the road if we really struggle and put it all on the line and fight for it, uh, if it sounds a little utopian, remember what Victor Hugo said in Les Miserables, there is nothing like a dream he wrote to create the future. Utopia today, flesh and blood tomorrow. So I think that you know, by 2050 uh, or thereabouts, in America the possible, we, we will have marshaled the economic and political resources to address this long list of challenges that I uh, began by reciting. And as a result, family incomes in America will be far more equal and similar to the situation in the Nordic countries or in Japan uh, today. Large-scale poverty and this vast economic insecurity that we have will be things of the past. And good jobs will be guaranteed uh, to all those who want to work. And our health care uh, system and our educational system will be among the best in the world, as will our standing in child welfare and the equality of women. And today's big social problems, uh, whether it's gun violence or homicide, or drugs or incarceration or white collar crime, Wall Street hijinks, the banksters, will all be down to acceptable levels. And big international challenges like the national debt and the illegal immigration and the future of social security and the shift to sustainable energy and environmental and consumer protection will have been successfully addressed. And our emissions of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases will be down by, by mid-century to a, a very small fraction. 
of what they are uh, today. Internationally, we will have assumed the role, as Chalmers Johnson put it, of a normal nation. Uh, military spending will be reduced to a level that is about equal to Europe's today. And uh, our interventions, uh, military interventions, will be rare and our arms sales small. And the resources thus freed up, and we have to be wary of this at this very minute, uh, you know, would be applied not so much to reduce the deficit, but to deal with the large number of other pressing international problems, these unconventional threats to security, uh, whether we're talking about climate change or other global environmental threats and nuclear proliferation or world poverty or water shortages and underdevelopment of fragile and failing states. These, these are huge problems that are going to demand real attention and real money from our country. Politically, the implementation of pro-democracy political reforms will have saved our politics uh, from corporate control and the power of money. And government in America will again be respected for its competence and efficiency. We've so beaten back government with so much criticism, so much underfunding, so much outsourcing, so much uh, uh, criticism that uh, you know, we've got to rebuild. And, and yes, our taxes are going to be higher, especially for those who have resources to pay. Um, you know, I mentioned, didn't put on that list of superlatives that we are the least taxed among that group of 20 advanced democracies. Uh, pay effective tax rate, half of Denmark, for example. Uh, not advocating that our taxes be doubled, um, but they need, there's plenty of room out there uh, to rebuild uh, and, and not to shred our uh, social safety nets and other programs that our country needs. Um, and the economy needs to be governed to ensure a broadly shared prosperity and to preserve the integrity of the biological uh, richness in the natural world. It's just got to be part uh, of the DNA uh, of our economic activity that the system is designed to prioritize people and place and planet and not profit and product as in GDP and power. Corporations have to be brought under a new level of public control and new patterns of business ownership and management involving workers and communities and other stakeholders should become the norm. What we really need to think about is how do we restructure our political economy so that we have a system that's truly restorative, uh, restorative of people, restores the land, restores our society. What we have now best described as a ruthless economy. Uh, not my phrase, it's from the famous macroeconomics textbook of Paul Samuelson and Bill Nordhaus, uh, where they say ours is a ruthless economy. And in its ruthlessness, anything can be sacrificed on the altar of GDP. But those of you who don't know, that's grossly distorted picture. <laughs> um, now, Obviously, we won't get anywhere near that America of the possible uh, unless we are capable of changing our culture and our values, our consciousness uh, in, in the country. Uh, so we have to remember what Patrick Daniel Moynihan said, where he said that, you know, he agreed with the conservatives that values and culture are extraordinarily important in determining the fate of societies. But that's the central conservative truth, he said. But the central liberal truth is that a society can change its values and change its culture and raise its consciousness and save itself from itself. Uh, so I think we need to think about value change. In what directions do we want the values to shift in? We, we obviously need to see ourselves uh, as something that uh, is you know, part of nature, uh, not apart uh, from nature, uh, close kin uh, to wild things, offsprings of an evolutionary uh, process. Uh, we need to move from seeing nature in strictly utilitarian terms, uh, our resource to exploit as we see fit, uh, to seeing the natural world as something having intrinsic value, independent of us, as Aldo Leopold uh, wrote. 
We need to move from discounting the future, from this uh, severe contempo centrism that uh, we have, to taking the long view and recognizing that we have profound duties to future generations. We need to escape from our materialism and, and our affluenza uh, and prioritize uh, instead uh, personal and family relationships, learning, experiencing nature, spirituality, service, volunteering, living within limits. And we've got to move from tolerating these gross economic and social and political disparities and injustices in our society to demanding a high measure of social equality. Well, we just don't have to sit around and wait on this. We know a good bit about how values uh, can shift. I asked a group of psychologists one time uh, what they thought would lead to a national conversion experience, because I didn't think we had much time. Uh, what, would, what could cause an epiphany in, in our society of real, real uh, realization and change? And of course, they said it would be a crisis, a deep crisis that delegitimized the, the current order uh, and the status quo. And of course, the Great Depression is a classic example of this. And I think we can be confident that we haven't seen the end of crises, uh, deep and serious crises. And, uh, but it, constructive change will, over, will only be born out of these crises if we are prepared uh, for them. Uh, leadership, uh, uh, transformational leadership in our country and social narrative uh, are also major forces for, for value change and, and raising uh, consciousness. As Harvard's uh, Howard Gardner says, leaders have a profound uh, ability to change minds uh, and change history uh, if they tell a new story that makes sense of where we are and where we need to go, and they live that story in their lives. Uh, that, uh, that can really be very extraordinary in uh, changing uh, our, our, our consciousness and in changing our values. Uh, we need a new American story uh, a new narrative which isn't yet available, I don't think. Um, social movements can have a huge effect in consciousness raising and changing values. Uh, they're all about that, really. Uh, and, uh, you know, we see that going on in our country today uh, with uh, gay and lesbian rights. Uh, the civil rights movement was a classic example. Um, our faith communities uh, can be uh, extremely uh, important. Uh, in uh, changing values and, and consciousness. And uh, here I am in this, uh, this podium uh, and thinking about all of the great groups that uh, sponsored the event tonight and, uh, and, what the, and the work that is going on here uh, to build uh, a new situation on the ground, bringing the future into the present, uh, into everyday reality. And I think that's probably the most profound uh, thing that, um, that changes people's minds, is seeing is believing. And, and as we create uh, the future in our communities, uh, that uh, can have a profound effect in raising uh, consciousness and changes values. So I want to thank uh, you know, the, the, the principal sponsor, the New Economics Institute and its Berkshire office, the uh, Community Land Trust of the Southern Berkshires, Project Native, uh, Berkshires, Orion Magazine, uh, the Community Development Corporation of uh, South Berkshire, uh, Berkshire uh, Grown, uh, the Sheffield Land Trust, the Egremont Land Trust, and the Great Barrington Land Conservancy. When I saw that list, I said to myself, well, I sure better do a good job. <laughs> but you are building this future. You're bringing the future into the present and creating uh, these examples that can change minds and raise consciousness. And of course, education, where I've spent most of my life, uh, is, uh, is, is very important. Uh, nothing could, could be more important in, in reaching young people. Uh, and, um, and but there are other types of education. There's experiential education and there's social marketing, which has had a huge effect on, on things like drunk driving and, uh, and other issues. So, um, you know, one of the great things about the future that we can bring into the present 
uh, or the, uh, you know, things like the things that you've led in here, uh, community land trust, uh, CSA, uh, local currencies, uh, the food movement, ecological restoration, uh, intentional communities, co-ops and state banks and credit unions, a state genuine progress indicator, which we're developing in, in Vermont. These are all ways of bringing the future into the present uh, and setting the models that can inspire action on a broader uh, scale. Um, in addition to, to value change, I think there are three things that we need to think hard about as we consider the future and, and, uh, and what kind of world we need, uh, say, you know, by 2050. And, and three things that, uh, that need to be brought together uh, that can lead us to a new way of living. You know, first, the imperative of protecting the Earth's climate. I don't think we've really, you know, faced up, not even to the simple things we need to do to uh, to address the climate challenge, but the deeper things are going to cause major lifestyle changes and a major rethinking of our uh, growth fetish uh, if we're going to deal with the climate issue over time successfully. Uh, we need to adjust to the rise of scarcities in commodities and energy and water and other resources, and we need to take seriously the teachings of this new field of, of uh, positive psychology, which has, um, you know, one of the leaders in that field was asked, can you summarize quickly uh, what it is that, that leads to life high levels of life satisfaction and high levels of happiness in a society? And this person said, yes, in two words, other people. Uh, it's not getting and spending, it's not having more, uh, it's other people. So if we take all of these things uh, together and, and seriously, uh, here's some dimensions uh, of America the possible that I think we can uh, work for and, and hope for. Uh, economic and social life will be far more rooted in the community and the region. Uh, more production will be local and regional with shorter uh, and less complex uh, supply chains. This is already happening in, in the food area and uh, Susan Weir and others are working now uh, with you uh, to develop not just community supported agriculture, but community-supported industry and applying that model uh, to a much wider array of uh, enterprises. And so these enterprises of the future will be more rooted and committed uh, to the long term. Uh, and uh, people will you know, live closer to work. They'll walk more and travel less. Uh, energy production will be distributed and decentralized and predominantly renewable. Uh, community bonds will be stronger, and politically, local governance is going to stress participatory and direct and deliberative democracy. There'll be new business models, I uh, mentioned earlier, locally owned uh, businesses, uh, worker-owned businesses, consumer-owned businesses, uh, public-private hybrids, profit-not-for-profit hybrids, social enterprises, um, community development corporations, uh, so this will, these could become the norm. Uh, plenitude, uh, consumerism, um, which is really when people try to find meaning and, 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 and life satisfaction out of consumption, uh, a, you know, a misguided enterprise, would be supplanted by the search for abundance and things that truly matter, uh, that bring happiness and, and real joy to us, our family and our friends, a natural world, meaningful work, and this is a, one of the local areas that has pioneered the idea of take back your time, more time, slower lives. And, um, you know, we could substitute uh, uh, this extra work that we do uh, for spending more time with our family and friends or hobbies, continuing education, skills development, caregiving, volunteering, exploring nature, the arts. Um, you know, life would be slower. Uh, less frenetic, uh, resonance with nature, uh, environmental protection regulations will be tough and demanding, and energy efficiency will be stressed. Prices are going to affect the true cost of things, and uh, it only makes sense if you're going to raise the prices and really internalize all those environmental externalities that are not paid by the companies today, and if we're going to get rid of 
all the misleading and perverse subsidies that we have uh, in, our, in our economic system, well, prices are going to go up. But it only makes sense if we're also dealing with the social justice challenge. You know, half the American families live paycheck to paycheck, aren't really saving, are financially fragile. Half the American families say they can, could not raise $2,000 in 30 days if they needed to do so for an emergency. Uh, you know, so these, uh, the issue of, of social equity is intimately tied to the success uh, of environmental uh, causes. How could we, you know, do the most elementary thing that environmental economics teaches us, which is to try to get the prices right, to have environmentally honest prices. Uh, if, uh, in fact, um, you know, the, the, we, we, the world that the people are so economically insecure, they're not going to tolerate that. And that's the situation in the country today. Um, and we need to move to a world where GDP growth is not seen as a priority, uh, where the things that we really do want to grow and do need to grow, we concentrate public policy in those areas to ensure that they, they do grow. Um, you know, we've had tons of, um, of growth in the country over the past several decades. The U.S. economy today is maybe 125 percent bigger than it was when Reagan was elected in 1980. What did all that growth bring us since 1980? And all this growth, and in the teeth of all that growth, uh, uh, we had inequality remount to 1928 levels. Uh, we had the poverty go to an all-time high. Uh, we still have about 15% of the American public that's unable to either find a job at all or is find a good job, is working part-time, or dropped out of the labor force. Uh, the economy is already back above uh, 2008 uh, levels before the Great Recession, and uh, we still have these tremendous uh, social and unemployment uh, problems uh, in the country. In the teeth of all that growth, uh, life satisfaction flatlined the entire period, wages flatlined the entire period, real wages, real wage, wage rates. Uh, depression went up, trust went down. And the environment has moved to the point that we're on the cusp of ruining the planet. So, you know, growth is clearly not the way to grow. There are a lot of things we do need to grow, like good jobs, but we ought to be concentrating public policy on those areas. Think of all the tremendous things that, uh, that need doing in our country, all the unmet social and environmental and other needs. And uh, think of all the good, able-bodied Americans who want to work. And only government can intermediate between those those two. And uh, so, you know, we need to be focusing public policy on stimulating job, creating, uh, job creation in areas of, uh, of democratically determined priority. Uh, and, you know, we not part of our political discourse right now, but it's the only way we're going to put Americans back to work. You have to grow in this country at two and a half percent at least, maybe three percent, just to take care of the new entrance into the labor force if you're just relying on GDP growth uh, to put people to work. And we're not going to grow that way. You know, Massachusetts is um, one of the leading investors in the country. Uh, Jeremy Grantham in Boston uh, recently issued one of his quarterly newsletters projecting that U.S. economic growth is probably going to be around 1 percent, real terms, for the indefinite future, if he had to put a number on it. So we have a huge problem in our country with poverty and unemployment and underemployment, but we need the government to get out there and do the right things to address those problems directly. Uh, well, all right, so America the Possible sounds pretty good. Uh, this is a long laundry list of great things that need to happen. Uh, how in the world might it happen? Uh, how might it actually happen? Um, well, I think the first thing that has to happen is that a lot of people have to come to three conclusions. Uh, the first of those conclusions is that something is profoundly wrong when you have so many problems across the whole front of political and economic and social and environmental issues. When you have so many problems, as we do, uh, it can't be due to small reasons. We have encompassing problems because we have a system of political economy that is programmed, hardwired to deliver other things 
than the well-being of people in place and planet. And if we want, and this is the first conclusion, if we want to deal effectively with these problems over time, we've got to change the system. We've got to complement incremental reforms of the type that we've maybe all been fighting for in our lives uh, with an equal or maybe larger commitment to deep systemic uh, change. Uh, that's the second conclusion. And the third conclusion is that, you know, contrary to what we uh, hear a lot, uh, a better alternative does indeed exist. If you look at all the dimensions of change that we need in consumerism, in our growth fetish, in our indicators of well-being, uh, in uh, the corporate sector, and so on, there are great groups working on all these issues, and there's a tremendous vitality in the country. Uh, there's plenty out there to convince us that we're not stuck with this current system, that a better world is indeed possible, and that we can start building it. And we don't know all the answers, but we know enough to get started. And we should have confidence that we can do something better than what we've got uh, today. So these are the foundations, these conclusions, these realizations. And more and more people come to them. Um, here's some conditions, here's some things that might uh, happen. Um, you know, as the conditions in the country uh, continue to fester or get worse, which is entirely possible, uh, an ever larger number of Americans lose faith in the system and its ability to deliver on the promises that it proclaims, and the system loses support, and there's a crisis of legitimacy uh, in America uh, with the current order of things. And then add to that the likelihood of the emergence of uh, the continuation of traditional crises in the economy and the environment. Uh, and in response, the progressives do something which they desperately need to do, and that is to get out of their silos and to coalesce into one progressive force uh, in the country to find their voice, to find their strength, uh, to build the backbone institutions that cut across all the progressive issues, uh, to uh, forge a common platform, to build a common identity, to get good about messaging, much as the conservative uh, are. Uh, in addition to this progressive fusion, uh, demonstrations and protests multiply. A popular movement for pro-democracy and, and reform is, is born. Uh, at the local level and the regional level, groups continue to innovate and build these models of the future into the present. Um, and then finally, seeing the direction in which things are, are moving in the wake of a proliferation of, of protests and, uh, and, and recurring uh, crises, um, our political leaders uh, finally do rise to the occasion, uh, become transformational leaders, uh, support the growing movement for change, and frame a compelling story or a narrative, a new American story that, uh, that relates the, the journey that we've all been through, uh, the good parts and the bad parts, and projects the world that we could together build. So we don't know exactly how those forces might emerge, uh, or what, how they would interact, or what sequence they might emerge in. But I think we do know one big thing, uh, that when this kind of cascading of change forces uh, begins, um, it's going to be met with a fierce resistance, right? So really, a, an all-important conclusion that emerges, that emerges uh, from that is that the prospects for deep systemic change will depend heavily on the democracy that we have built, the movement that we, uh, for deep change uh, that we uh, have built. And so in the wake of this election and all the shenanigans and vote suppression and lies and big money that we saw, we need to build a movement for pro-democracy political reform in the country uh, while these memories are fresh and while our uh, commitment to, to change in our politics to save us from this creeping corporatocracy and plutocracy that we see and the big money and the PACs, uh, we need to uh, get serious about an agenda of pro-democracy political reform that spans everywhere from securing the vote and securing the voter to, uh, to constitutional amendment, uh, undermining the string of Supreme Court cases of which Citizens United is the most well known, 
uh, to lobbying reform, to passing legislation uh, calling for small donor and federal financing of federal elections, uh, to having voter registration be the default position as it is in most advanced countries. You're 18, you are registered. There's a long list of uh, you know, political reforms that we need to take in our country. There's a lot that can be done with lobbying. The Democrats have got to do away with the filibuster come January. Um, you know, we need to close the revolving door. We need to do what Connecticut did and ban the bundling of lobbying contributions to campaign, lobbyist contributions to campaigns. There's a big agenda there, uh, and we need to get busy with it uh, while our memories of this past election, as I say, are still fresh uh, and strong. Um, so in the end, uh, I think it really all comes down to us, right? Uh, it all comes down to the American people and the possibility that we still have it in us to use our freedom and to use our democracy in a powerful way uh, to create something fine, a reborn America, to realize a new American dream. If enough of us join together and fight for it, I think we can do it, but it will require a real sacrifice uh, and uh, it will require a lot of the type of commitment that we saw in the Civil Rights Movement and that we saw in the 60s and the anti-war movement. Uh, I was happy to spend three days in the central cell block of the D.C. jail uh, protesting the tar sands uh, pipeline. I would uh, do it again in a heartbeat and may do it again in February because McKibben, God bless him, is organizing uh, something else for, for that window. But, um, you know, we, uh, we were happy warriors in that jail those three days. And I, I said to Bill at the end of the third day, towards the end, I, Bill, when are we going to get out of here? And, <laughs> and he, he, said, uh, he said to me, he said, Martin Luther King spent a lot more time in jail than you are. We have yet, Gus. And I said, oh, my Lord, that's not the answer I was hoping for, Bill. <laughs> um, and, uh, but he's a great leader, and, uh, and he is leading on this climate issue. And uh, we need to follow that leader and, and build more of them uh, because uh, you know, this is a desperate problem. And, but... Um, I think we can uh, realize this new American dream if enough of us bring that spirit uh, to the cause. And this dream envisions an America where the pursuit of happiness uh, is sought not in more getting and spending, Lord, we've had enough of that, uh, but in the growth of real human solidarity, in the growth of real democracy, in the devotion to the public good, and where the average American is empowered to achieve his or her potential, where the benefits of economic activity are widely and equitably shared, where the environment is sustained for current and future generations, uh, and where the virtues of simple living and community self-reliance and good fellowship and respect for nature and respect for the land are the predominant values. These are American traditions. Uh, they're not dead. They await us and they are indeed uh, being awakened uh, today across our great country. Uh, new ways of, of living and working, of caring and, and sharing are emerging across America. And they beckon us with a new American dream, an America the possible, built from the very best of who we were and are today and can be in the future. Thank you very, very much for listening to this.